So much goes into making every moment of every show of the films that we love. So many stories are going on behind the stories that are being told. Hey, every great story has a back door, and you just found ours. This is everything you need to know. What's up, Internets? I am Durden Godfrey, and this is everything you need to know about Pink Floyd, The Wall. The Wall follows Pink, a depressed, detached rock star grappling with traumatic experiences from losing his father to World War II, mental and physical abuse at school, poems, no less. Poems, everybody! And coddling from his overbearing single mother that has evolved into rifts between him and his wife. Feeling trapped with a metaphorical wall made up of each trauma, the film follows Pink as he slips deeper into madness. It's a musical, but not a musical. Nearly 30 songs and a collage of sequences, driven by music, make up a majority of the film. But less than 10 songs are actually sung by the actors on the screen. Cast and Crew the Wall was written by Pink Floyd co-founder and frontman, Roger Waters. It is his only feature film writing credit. The struggles with alienation at the heart of The Wall were something that Waters was personally working through. After Pink Floyd gained mainstream fame in the mid-70s, he began feeling increasingly disconnected from their fans. The lyrics to In the Flesh refer to a surrogate band. In concerts for The Wall, the opening song was In the Flesh, and it was never played by Pink Floyd. Instead, other musicians would come out and play it while wearing masks, giving the audience the impression that they were watching Pink Floyd. This was part of Waters' attack on the perceived separation between musicians and the audience that can happen at huge stadium shows where it almost didn't matter who was on stage. Taking on the role of directing was legendary filmmaker and Pink Floyd fan, Alan Parker. Alan Parker directed a few things before The Wall, but nothing that really stood out to me with the exception of a G-rated 1976 film starring a young, obviously, Jodie Foster and Scott Baio alongside an all-child cast telling the story of Bugsy Malone. After The Wall, Alan Parker would go on to direct Birdie, starring Nicolas Cage and Matthew Modine, who you kids will know from Stranger Things as Dr. Martin Brenner, Angel Heart with Mickey Rourke and Robert De Niro, Mississippi Burning with Gene Hackman, Willem Dafoe, and Francis McDormand. Road to Wellville with Anthony Hopkins, Bridget Fonda, and Matthew Broderick. Evita with Madonna and Antonio Banderas. And one of my personal favorites, The Life of David Gale, starring Kevin Spacey, Kate Winslet, and Laura Linney. Life of David Gale, which premiered in 2002, was Alan Parker's final film. Rest in peace, he passed away on July 31st of 2020 due to, according to a spokeswoman for the British Film Institute, a long, unspecified illness. During the production of The Wall, Alan Parker walked out many times, most likely due to egos clashing between him and Roger Waters, who was annoyed with Parker because he didn't like the idea of making it a cult film. Parker refers to The Wall as the most expensive student film ever made. Parker wasn't even originally going to be the one to direct The Wall. At first, he was going to produce, with Michael Saracen directing the live action segments. Aside from working as Parker's director of photography on many projects, Saracen also worked on Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, All Good Things, and the new Planet of the Apes films. And a special mention to Gerald Scarf, the animation director, responsible for the brilliant animated sequences that make up a large portion of the film. And fun fact, according to IMDb, apparently Gerald Scarf took the lamps from Pink's hotel room because he thought they would look nice in his house. Pink, the film's main character, is played wonderfully by Irish singer-songwriter Bob Geldof. Geldof is more known in the music community. He was the lead singer of Boomtown Rats in the 70s and was part of the supergroup Band-Aid in the 80s. The Wall is Geldof's only starring role in a major feature film. Prior to that, 
He starred in two music videos and an episode of a TV series called The Kenny Everett Television Show. According to IMDb, he actually initially wanted nothing to do with the film because he didn't like Pink Floyd's music. You could also say that Roger Waters wasn't a fan of Geldof's music either. In the movie, Geldof's voice is used during the performances of In the Flesh to the dismay of Waters, who felt Geldof's voice was too distinctly Irish. However, he would very often praise Geldof's performance as Pink. Waters actually wrote The Wall with himself in mind for the lead, but apparently lackluster screen tests led to the casting of Geldof. Of course, another musician with no prior acting experience. Alan Parker believed that Waters was too close to the material to do it properly. After The Wall, he appeared in one or two TV movies and he showed up as himself in a cameo on 1997's Spice World. Pink's mother is played by English actress Christine Hargreaves. She played Christine Appleby on Coronation Street, the longest running soap opera on television. And Christine was there in the beginning for its first four years from 1960 to 1963. Hargreaves would go on to star in many UK film and TV productions, and I apologize if I am butchering your name, Christine Hargreaves, Hargreaves, Hargreaves. One year before the wall, she played a ticket lady in an American werewolf in London, and in 1984, the year she passed away, she played the soup lady in George Orwell's 1984. She had two credits, which released posthumously in 1985, an episode of Victoria Wood as seen on TV, and a film called 1919. Pink's father is played by New Zealand actor James Lawrenson, with over 110 credits under his belt. His most recent roles are Dr. Weir in Netflix's The Crown and Sir John Barrow in AMC's The Terror. Pink's wife is played by English actress Eleanor David. The Wall was her first feature film role, having previously starred in a few television series and a TV movie. She'd go on to star in films such as 84 Sharing Crossroad and Topsy Turvy. Her most recent film credit to date is a 2009 German LGBTQ film called House of Boys. Young Pink is played by Kevin McKeon, a British actor with an interesting filmography. The Wall was his first film and first credit in general. 11 years later, he co-wrote, co-directed, and played the lead in a film called A Formula for Mayhem. And that's it, according to IMDb. The manager was played by the late, great Bob Hoskins. He has over 121 credits, including Brazil, Hook, Nixon, and his final role in Snow White and the Huntsman. But he will always be Eddie Valiant from Who Framed Roger Rabbit to me. And unfortunately, I can't help but think about the headache of a film that was the Super Mario Brothers movie when I think of Bob Hoskins. And I wonder if a time will ever come when society reaches such a low that the Super Mario Brothers movie finally gets the credit it never deserved. Anyway, the groupies have some interesting credits following the wall. Jenny Wright was also the love interest in The Lawnmower Man, and Joanne Whaley played Sorsha in Willow. Michael Enzyme played the hotel manager in The Wall, and then played the hotel manager two years later in Ghostbusters. The extras in the Run Like Hell and Waiting for the Worm sequences were actually neo-Nazis, cast for realism. Later, a fascist group would actually spring up in the late 1980s called the Hammerskins, and they used the Double Hammer logo from the film as their insignia. This was much to the dismay of Gerald Scarf, Alan Parker, and Roger Waters, as their intentions were to make the portrayal anti-fascist. Speaking of the Hammerskins logo, have you noticed its colors, red and white? And what happens if you mix red and white together? That's right, kids. You get pink. And there's a member of the cast who took part in the film without even realizing it. In the scene where Pink is calling his home from the United States, Bob Geldof actually made a call to England through a random, unsuspecting AT&T operator. The conversation was recorded and played over the sequence in the film, and it was also used at the end of Young Lust on the album. Production Facts The concept of making a film that would serve as a sibling to the album was conceived before the band went into the studio to record The Wall. Originally, the plan was to use live footage from the band's tour of the album, cut with Scarf's animations and some extra scenes. As mentioned previously, Roger Waters was intended to be the lead, 
After that fell through during screen tests, the idea of using actual footage from the band's tour no longer made much sense, so that went too. And that's when The Wall really began to transform from the original vision that Waters had and the movie so many fans would come to know and love. Production began in September of 1981, and it wrapped in that December. The production seemed to be a nightmare for everyone involved. Parker described the filming as one of the most miserable experiences of his life. Waters shared Parker's sentiments, saying that it was a very unnerving and unpleasant experience. Scarf would drink some whiskey in the morning before being able to bring himself to go on to the set. It was shot in various spots around England. The school scenes were filmed at the Royal Masonic School in Hertfordshire. The school scenes were filmed at the Royal Masonic School in Hertfordshire, which ceased operations in 1966 to become an international college, used for many productions in search of the unnerving setting that the school provides, including Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, the Harry Potter films, Monty Python's Meaning of Life, and more. It was eventually purchased by a home developer who began planning in 1998 to turn it into upscale condos. Shame. Olympic Stadium in Quebec, Canada was the only location outside of England. We all know the scene where Pink shaves his entire body, and most of you have probably heard that this moment was inspired by a similar thing that happened with Pink Floyd's founder, Sid Barrett, who left the band long before the wall after becoming mentally ill. But something that was news to me is, according to IMDb, Bob Geldof is terrified of blood and had difficulty with the razor scene. So throwing himself totally into it and becoming seized by the role, he improvised the shaving of his entire body. The scene only called for the shaving of his eyebrows. Speaking of blood, Geldof managed to cut open his hand pretty badly during the scene where Pink destroys the hotel room. Much like Leonardo DiCaprio in Django Unchained, he kept on performing until director Alan Parker called a rap on the scene. Geldof also dislikes baths and is unable to swim. So during the scene where he is floating in the swimming pool, he was supported by a plastic body mold. And that same mold was later used for the flying sequences in 1984's Supergirl. In the entire film, Bob Geldof only has one line that is not a lyric by Pink Floyd. According to IMDb, actress Jenny Wright was not told that Geldof would be throwing a bottle at her in this scene. So her reaction of ducking was totally spontaneous. The Wall premiered in the US on August 6th, 1982, before seeing a limited release on August 13th. While Pink Floyd's The Wall is adored by countless fans and critics, landing on Roger Ebert's Great Movies list and with a 71% critic score and an 89% audience score on Rotten Tomatoes, but Pink Floyd the band, as well as the film's key crew members, feel differently viewing the film as a disappointment in general. Roger Waters said, it is too depressing and doesn't allow the audience to sympathize with Pink. Alan Parker, while proud of the film, felt that the result was amateurish. Pink Floyd's guitarist, David Gilmore, said that the film was the least successful version of The Wall's concept, and Gerald Scarf said on the DVD commentary that he doesn't understand why people like the film. But that's the thing about art, Gerald. And yes, I'm telling Gerald Scarf about art. Why great art appeals to some people and not others, or why some things live on and on, resonating more and more with each generation, and why other things are forgotten before the earth makes another pass around the sun, there's no sense to it. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, or whatever. Something about the wall speaks to people, and probably for many different reasons depending on who you talk to because that is what great art does. While I can respect or at least appreciate the filmmakers being disappointed because the results didn't match their initial expectations, they should also be proud to have crafted a meaningful place of cinema that has stood the test of time and that is still creating conversations to this day. And now, you know everything that there is to know about Pink Floyd The Wall. If I missed anything, please put it in the comments. Once again, I am Durden Godfrey, this is TTFT. If you like movies, you should be subscribed to our channel. Have a great day. Take that, fuckers. Peace out.
Hey guys, hey gals, did you like that? Mm hmm. I know I did. And here's something YouTube thinks you'll like. They've actually recommended. What do you recommend? I recommend that if you have not subscribed to our channel, that you please click right down there and make sure you correct that wrong this very instant. Let me ask a question Where can they find us? All those places over there. We're everywhere. Everywhere. We thought we could do a cooler outro. We're just going to walk away now. <laughs>